All right, so I'm Scott Scott. I guess I've been on climate strike since private sector and uh, devoted myself full time to atmospheric science and uh, doing translational research to figure out how we can address climate and other environmental adaptation and mitigation issues. So that means I've been doing this for six years and uh, trending on Twitter yesterday and today was a hashtag signs are not very popular. So I've been doing research translation and translational research on actually addressing uh, environmental problems for 16 years and now a 16 year old is coming to give an inspiring talk and it's a crowd much larger than mine. So it's not very popular. Um, but super fun research program popular and uh, it's part of my job to help make sure that that happens and to determine how to train folks and inspire folks and work with principal investigators to go from doing basic and applied research to making stuff happen. So this is a workshop series and I'm going to uh, use our first in this series as, as a workshop. We'll talk. I'm not going to lecture all that much unless you want me to and I'll let you choose your own adventure when it comes to what aspects of what we do uh, you get to hear a lecture. So the research life cycle taxonomy, I want to see if we can get on the same page about how research works and how it moves from you have an idea about something that might be interesting to study or might be important to a way that this somehow informs something in the real world or something beyond our lab group. How does that happen? So basic research, bench science, mechanistic, understanding processes. Who here is a basic researcher? Applied research taking those findings to the bench and seeing what happens. So I do a lot of applied research and my parents really like when I do global studies. They see a global map and they're like, yeah, that's applied research. You're taking something, a bunch of processes that were found in lab or field experiments and seeing what happens. When I do the same thing at high, resolu high resolution over the mega city where they live, it's, it's global, it's really impressive. So applied research use that to inform what's happening, to understand at a larger scale beyond the initial set of studies, the potential impacts. Global burden of disease takes, that assessment takes a bunch of basic and applied research studies and combines them into this mega applied study. What diseases, where, how much, causes, costs, potential benefits of controlling. And then there's research translation. Distilling, data reduction, message reduction from all this basic and applied research into I had a prior uh, career as a summer camp counselor and a parent, and so I turned to the book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. And we tend to think of research translation doing so. Going from what we found in the sciences from base. inform something beyond communicating our results to our peers. Traditionally, and especially in the United States, the emphasis 
on science has been. A whole lot of basic research, that's a real researcher. A few applied researchers who then take those results and use big data, machine learning, and larger sample sizes and models of stuff that we found in the real world and come up with stuff that by just communicating the applied results, we know what's going on. We're informed. And hoping that there is a translational pipeline where we have a large number of well-funded basic researchers, a small number of well-funded applied researchers, and some critical or staff or outreach or undergrads who are really interested and motivated or no one doing research translation. Our tenure and promotion policies tend to be do a bunch of applied research, do a bunch of basic research, hope that someone somehow translates this into some societal benefit. Let the funders do that. Have the funders condense the results. Have journalists condense the results. Into something that might make it into the world. And of course, those two are things that you want to professional scientists and faculty do. And translation is the wave of the future that there should be some infrastructure for. Long ago, when I was a junior, junior, junior assistant professor in my first year, I went to a talk by Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University, and he said, you know, research translation is the wave of the future. We're going to try to find ways to fund it. We're going to try to find ways to have universities and I said, what about those of us who do both basic and applied research and want to have it have a real impact and find ourselves working with policy uh, Lots of folks who are who go into the science by the you where federal governments, funding agencies, intergovernmental collaborations, and the scientific community have been far more proactive than the individual institution at making this process something that we can all contribute to and all find value in as part of what we do. Show of hands, who here is a trainee of the Iowa Superfund Research Program? That's a basic and applied research and training program. Okay, so our objective in that program is specified by the funders. Train the next generation of people who will be involved in cleaning up the worst of the worst sites, the worst of the worst natural and anthropogenic toxic compounds. Have them learn to do all of these things and to have research that they're undertaking proceed, whether it's through one person or through many hands, going from basic to applied to translation.
So in the traditional 1950s through early 2000s world, research translation was something that was done for scientists, for researchers, by someone else. Super fun research program in the said, you're going to be mandated to have a research translation core that has to do certain things to translate your research results out into the real world. You don't have to do this yourself, researchers. You just have to focus on what you're doing in the lab and make sure that you have some funding to have other folks talk to other funded research centers communicate your results to the international research community. Partner with government agencies on public policy in some way, uh, based on the applied findings of what you do, or the basic findings of what you do. When you develop new technologies, transfer those to the private sector. Find ways to make money. Patent your new technologies that you propose and that you find. And then somehow make information, not just, well, at that time, definitely not the full data set, but some content that will be useful to someone, to some end user or stakeholder. And here we have David Osterberg and Craig Just uh, doing so. They're in this uh, photo. They're at the state capitol in Des Moines, and they're talking with a bunch of state legislators from Iowa and neighboring Midwestern states and their staff, explaining to them what PCBs are and why they're a problem. And so in this traditional research translation world, Research translation is passive. You have some folks who are ready to go once you as researchers have a result. Once you as researchers come up with a patented technology, then they react to that. And they communicate whatever it is that you find for you and translate it to something that might matter to an end user, whether it's a policymaker, another SRP center, the private sector, they have to go make all the connections for you, make that transfer happen, speak other languages, you focus on your science. By comparison, what's translational research? Can anyone define in their own terms translational research? I'm especially looking at trainees because the funded investigators on NIH studies probably have a CAN definition. What's translational research? Okay, so this is from bench to bedside. What does it take? clinical studies out a new intervention, whether it's a new type of surgery or a drug or therapy, and the traditional doing a tiny part of bringing a new finding from bench to bedside. And typically, at each step of the way, there's more people involved, right? Any other communities that you're here today that's not the traditional 
health world, where there's a vast hundred-year-old effort to make this type of thing happen. So we have challenges in transferring what we've done and how we've been successful in bringing stuff in the medical world from bench to bedside to have that same sort of effort work for other aspects of environmental science, like environmental regulation. Anyone else have a definition of translational research? So in tax, this is a gold standard. By taking something that you found from bench or field studies to having IARC make a conclusion based on something that you set into motion. National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences put a team on, on this of, uh, beginning in 2014 to try to figure out how could we put on the map all of these different ways of doing translational research, all these different ways that we can have something go from the basics of basic environmental health sciences out to something happening in the real world. And their objectives were to find a way to, communi to communicate and condense and expand and have a scope of this system of stuff that's funded by NIHS, all the stuff that's funded by NIHS, um, that represents the nuances of that research, gives us a common language, and helps us tell the story of how we go from not just bench to bedside, although that's part of it, but to all of these outcomes, to regulation, to IARC findings, to behavioral changes by communities to new technologies. How can we talk about all of these ways that our basic and applied research can have a real world impact? 
And so they started uh, bringing out a road show on this about two years ago and are now highly invested in uh, having funded researchers and trainees be able to speak this language. And the way that it goes is that uh, there's a bunch of different concentric rings. They're color coding them at this point and, uh, and trying to show that there's a progression from the bench out into the real world and that there's many steps along the way and that there's many ways that this can happen. And so within the fundamental basic world, there's things you might study in situ, in vitro, in vivo. There's application synthesis that comes from that. There's the next step that includes clinical testing, risk assessment, and uh, validation, and then going out to practice. Changes in policies, changes in clinical guidelines, changes in behaviors by populations. And at each step of the way, if you're doing multiple things, working, if you're working computationally and you're working with people who are doing field studies and people who are uh, doing bench studies, if you're making the same, asking the same types of questions across each of these, then that's translation research. Because you're building that base of evidence that then lets you go to the next step. So observing something in humans and then coming to an understanding in an animal model is translation. And vice versa, finding something unexpected in, in, in animals and then seeing, well, does that happen in humans too, is a form of translational research. You're not just limited to one frame, one set of methods, one set of questions about a topic, but that you're beginning to bridge this identification, observation, and understanding. And Iowa Superfund Research Program has five projects, five research cores, and I've color coded them here. And there's a lot of them that are overlapping in, in their dots, but I put a colored dot next to what each of the projects and cores does. And you can see that there's many ways that each project or core might go some of them go from the very center at the bench out all the way th through three or four of these rings, eventually out to some real world outcome. And the more that you get to the support course, community engagement, research translation, the more that you find roles in toward those outskirts of changes in environmental exposures, changes in population out health outcomes, changes in clinical outcomes. And so one of the values of having an integrated basic and applied research and training program is to make this happen and to have our individual trainees and investigators learn how to and teach others how to and develop best practices on how to make this happen. We know how to make this happen in the traditional medical field. And now there's this push for how do we do so beyond that scope? How do we talk about it? How do we recognize when we're doing something? How do we recognize that it's translational research when you're studying metabolism in human serum and someone else is studying metabolism in an animal model. You're talking about the same processes, but using very different tools, very different experimental methods, very different powers of your uncertainty and your ability to drill down to what's happening. And from the large scale perspective, what we want to do as a 
environmental health sciences research community is be able to get good at talking about this stuff, both to ourselves and to the general public and to stakeholders, but also especially to do so. To recognize once we find something or once we have a question at the bench scale, what is it going to take for this research to have some sort of outcome? What would I need to do? Not what would I need to find, how powerful would my results need to be, but what would I need to do after that? And how much of that do I want to do and how much of that requires collaboration? And how long will this take? And what sort of paths might that take? And so I'll give you some examples of how that might happen, some from my research, some from stuff that we're doing, and provide some context on this research translation and translational research through what Iowa Superfund does. I'll note that when we have review panelists, for those of you who have or ever anticipate uh, writing proposals, review panelists are really good within and across domains, this is sideways, um, at at consistently rating the um, translational impacts, whether that's domain specific, whether that's across domains. So we're good at evaluating impact when it happens. Our question is, how can we make, how can we design that impact to happen? How do we design our studies or how do we change what we're doing when we get a hot finding to then make that happen? And uh, Iowa Superfund connects to Americans' biggest fears, some of them. So pollution of oceans, rivers, and lakes, pollution of drinking water, air pollution, high medical bills. Polychlorinated biphenyls have roles in all of those. When Great Lakes policymakers were asked, what are the biggest issues for the Great Lakes? Across all potential concerns, not just environmental, but everything. Safe drinking water, recreation and tourism, your ability to swim and fish in stuff, toxic contamination and other pollutants, nutrients, agricultural runoffs, and, and best management practices. Stuff that connects to PCBs is really high on the list. And so polychlorinated biphenyls have often been viewed as a has-been chemical, and but they're, they, and they were the original part of the original impetus for the Toxic Substances Control Act and for the Superfund CERCLA legislation as well. And they're still out there. And they're still out there at about the same concentrations as they were uh, when that legislation began. In fact, here's those Great Lakes areas of concern, and the vast majority of them have polychlorinated biphenyls as one of the reasons why they're an area of concern in the first place. In urban air, this, in this case in Chicago, you'd expect that if compound were banned in 1979, no further production, phased out of use, large Worst of the worst contaminated sites all cleaned up. You'd expect to see concentrations in air go down, right? Not so much. So this, these are observations from the International Atmospheric Definition Network in Chicago. Uh, I think about 500 feet from the classroom where my father uh, teaches at uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. And here they, here's total PCBs in the air from 1996 until 2008. And they dipped a little and then they went up again. And the average molecular weight of polychlorinated biphenyls in the air has increased as the more volatile stuff has volatilized off and now the less volatile stuff is coming off. So we're gradually seeing a reduction in the more volatile compounds, but it's a really long process, especially if we don't have new cleanup technologies. 
If we don't have new ways to remediate, if we don't have ways to prevent new unanticipated sources from coming out. PCBs in the same time period have kind of become a thing in schools, in rivers, in every major west coast port as every Pacific state is now suing Monsanto for producing PCBs. And so Iowa Superfund Research Program is the only uh, Superfund Research Center uh, that's dedicated to a planetary boundary threat. In our case, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls as a chemical boundary threat, both as this chemical pollution not yet quantified, its effects on biodiversity, both functional and genetic, and a source of risk to the global oceans in a similar planetary way. And you'll note that of these risks, so if you tried to say one planet or one global ocean's worth of resources is the boundary, where are we now? What would it take to start living within the boundaries of one planet? PCBs are within the range of stuff that we have a question mark. We don't know where we are. We don't know where the boundary is. We don't know how to effectively move toward within one planet's worth of the effects of polychlorinated biphenyls on reproductive capabilities, genetic damage, epigenetic effects that are multi-generational, metabolic effects, and that these are long-term. So it's kind of a fun thing to study when, compared to other stuff, any effort that you make, any finding that you have at the back, could inform any of these things could inform knowing where we're at, knowing where the global boundary is, knowing what specific issues along the way contribute to that, and learning how to clean it up, and then figuring out the most cost-effective ways to clean it up, and then actually getting that information out there. And you could imagine that if you're only doing bench stuff, you won't be able to figure out where the global boundary is. If you're only doing field stuff, you won't be able to figure out how to clean this up. If you're only doing the cleanup, you won't know how much it's going to matter. So we need all of this, and it helps to have an integrated center that's interdisciplinary and all working together to do this. So the US regulates and cleans up legacy, legacy toxics like PCBs through many different ways. Cleaning up the worst of the worst sites to low risk levels. Trainees, pop quiz, acceptable cancer risk level after cleaning up a national priority list contaminated site. How many cancer cases? Other guesses? Investigators? The typical standard is like one in a million cancer cases is how clean a national priority list site needs to be after being cleaned up. Prevalence of cancer among adults in the United States. One in two and a half, one in three, going to one in one to one. So we get our, we spend a lot of, of funds and invest a lot through CERCLA and Great Lakes regional initiatives to clean up the most contaminated sites to being really, really clean. And then we use uh, Clean Air Act and waste management to ensure that there's no new emissions and no new spills and no new Superfund sites. And then we have binational treaties and state level activities and other mechanisms to try to find and dispose of area source legacy 
equipment, like transformers in this case. And what are we not doing? Anything else. So what uh, typically happens with integrated regulatory approaches to criteria pollutants is you figure out what your control strategies are, you go after the sources, you simulate the transport transformation concentrations, environmental exposures, the adverse effects, and the monetized impacts of those. You do some research to find out the fate, the means of action, the exposure response, and then you come up with combination of control strategies, remediation, and health interventions so that you can have the biggest impact for the least amount of funds put in. You optimize on these so that you have the lowest cancer risk, the lowest adverse health outcomes. And at every step of the way, you know what your control strategies are and how they cost, how much they cost. You know what your remediation efforts are. And there's much greater uncertainty in the potential adverse effects and the exposure response than there is in that stuff. And what Iowa Superfund is trying to do is to reduce that uncertainty at all steps and to figure out how we can do this stuff. So translational research is, in many cases, providing the tools to end users so that when they don't know how to, they don't know how to solve a problem, they don't even know, in this case, where is the planetary boundary for polychlorinated biphenyls in the environment? Are the amounts of polychlorinated biphenyls in American adults or young people dangerous or safe? For which of the tens of thousands of potential adverse effects that they could have and the tens of dangerous effects that they're known to have. So within that context, traditional research translation has been get information to end users. And we've done, and to people who might want to know. And that has included sending investigators and trainees to small, small rural towns throughout Iowa to talk to elected officials and their staffs, to talk to other SRP centers, and to transfer technologies to commercial enterprises. You can quantify that you've done these things. You're not sure if they're going to have an impact. And so we were doing those things, and we had a logic model for how this would work, and that we would hopefully raise awareness, educate reactively figure out if there was a story that came out of research, who might be interested and how can we get that information to them. And so we did a lot of that and we did it really well, um, convening a series of uh, Midwest legislator environmental health summits uh, with lots of partnerships, teaching other funded research centers from across the country how to do this stuff, Implementing science cafes in small rural towns, advertising them, bringing crowds of ordinary folks who can learn about what we do at the university and why it matters and how they can reduce their exposures and potentially improve their health, including lots of trainees in this process so they can learn to talk to ordinary folks at a coffee shop about their research in ways that are accessible and that actually lead to a take home message that people can implement, quantifying what people learned and what they found interesting, transferring those technologies directly, working with at the large scale to transfer those technologies into action in pilot and real world case studies, in this case using uh, hybrid modified uh, poplar plants as a PCB bioremediation test case in Alta Vista, Virginia, at a contaminated lagoon near a wastewater treatment plant. Communicating results and helping digest the literature for a non-governmental organization, a parent and teacher organization in Malibu, California, that 
on their school is contaminated and working with them locally and as they then became a national non-governmental organization to try to figure out what can we do to provide useful data reduction and useful understanding of test results to end users. And we did that for several years, working directly with them, bringing them to uh, international PCB workshops, understanding the broader issue of PCBs in schools as a major way that children are, are exposed to PCBs, primarily through inhalation. Publishing on it, talking about those efforts in the scientific literature. Iowa Superfund also has a lot of investigator initiated, initiated research where investigators find something and then want to talk directly. And what, here's a trainee, an undergraduate, Mae Biddle, presenting her results directly to state legislators during the Legislators in the Lab Tour last year. So we have ways of getting the message out communicating, that's traditional research translation. And what we've been doing moving forward has been to think from a translational research perspective, what do people actually need? Not what can we push out, but what do people actually need? And so we've diversified, continuing to do those mandated act, traditional activities within this mandated approach, but also adding many other ways of bringing our research out into the real world and moving from along those rings from lab bench out into the real world through web applications, through webinars, through social media, through media relations, and by proactively evaluating what we do for impact, not merely quantifying how many people showed up to our talk but, or what they took home, but how has this led to an impact that could potentially be quantified. And what we found is that by doing so, you find what is actually making an impact. And we proposed a really big laundry list and of ways that we would do so for many different issues on polychlorine and biphenyls from, many project, from all of the projects and cores from, and connected to each of the research translation aims. And the value proposition now for Iowa Superfund Research Center is not merely to do the basic and applied work, but to share what we do, to learn from those connections, to see how it's impacting all of the potential end users and ways it might inform the world, to extend our methods and results directly, not just by sharing the data, but by sharing our research methods in a reproducible manner, and to maximize our impact at each spatial scale. And so this began a new chapter as we were we began informing a, an NGO and they started making front page news. Sold out fundraising events with uh, many of the local celebrities uh, whose children went to that particular contaminated school. And so we do lots of evaluation of how our work is affecting the broader world, including tra tracking citations and seeing the scholarly impact, as well as moving it beyond uh, to seeing what's actually happening. We've established extensive social media with about 215,000 impressions over the past five years. This week is the five, in fact, five, five year anniversary of our center beginning its social media efforts. And so we have th five years of data and narratives about each of the issues. In the process, we got connected with journalists who turned to six of our center investigators for information that led and contributed to an article in The Atlantic. that wouldn't have happened if we weren't on social media. 
We can use social media as a real-time monitoring effort to seeing what's happening in the places where we do community-engaged research and the policymakers who use our tools. And of course, featuring our trainees and investigators going out into the real world and doing stuff. We host many webinars as ways of doing traditional research translation. But where I start getting excited is where we start having global impact on policies. And that's more translational research. And that's stories that are based on, we found something. We found that we had a problem in our basic and applied research. We solved that problem for ourselves. We figured out how to solve it anywhere. And in the process, over time, we found that other people had the same problem and had no answer. And we came up with a replicable, free, instantaneous solution to that that's now used in global policy. And so that's, if I were to pick one of our many translational research stories that move from the bench to the ring. I would probably be talking about this one, but we have many of these. Um, I've got 20 minutes, so I want to be sure to take questions. But essentially what happened was I came in to Iowa Superfund in 2010, and I wanted to like know what was the concentrations of polychlorinated biphenyl compounds in air in the city of Chicago. I wanted to know the intra-urban variability. Were concentrations higher by cleaned up NPL sites? Were they higher around schools? Did the age of the building stock nearby matter? Did the socioeconomic status matter? Could I just get a map of concentrations of PCBs in air? And it seemed like this was a reasonable thing because Project 4 in Kerry Hornbuckle's lab had the world's largest urban observational sampling network for polychlorinated biphenyls in Chicago. And they took samples at schools. And I said, OK, let's see the results. That'll tell us how we could eventually model remediation and figure out what would be the most cost-effective way to clean up PCBs in air in the city? That's the impact I'd want to have. For myself, I came into the program and said, cities. To make that happen. Seems like a map of your concentrations of PCBs in a city, in the most studied city in the world for this set of compounds would be a good place to start. I found out that the variability in estimating the sampling rate for passive air sampling of this stuff was higher than the signal across different sites, which was kind of a problem because I couldn't trust the maps that I was given. And so I went to work and did some basic research and used my toolkit as an atmospheric scientist to come up with a mechanistic process-based hourly method for estimating passive sampling rate based on meteorology, land cover, other stuff. Used observations, used numerical weather prediction models, used all of my toolkit to come up with a way in the city of Chicago to answer that question to develop some confidence in passive sampling rate so that when I made a map of PCB concentrations across the city, I could trust it. And I could know how much I could trust it. And I could know whether a hotspot was really a hotspot or whether we just happened to uh, be sampling in conditions where our, our sampling methods were less certain, like when it's really cold and windy, or whether it's when it's really humid.
later went back, worked with the team two years later to revise that study and release the not open source, because it was for MATLAB, source code for simulating passive air sampling rates. Found out that this was kind of a big deal. Globally, everyone was using this one set of numbers from the mid-latitudes from a handful of studies in England and the United States as the number for passive air different sampling media. And we were just taking those as assumed given canonical. And we found that there was that there was real variability by the day, by where in the world you were. And we began working with the Global Atmospheric Passive Sampling Network. which is the exclusive, the only network that's out there collecting samples for UN Environment Program, Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution Convention, and the Stockholm Convention. They had the same issue too. And it was really expensive for them to spike each of their passive samplers with tracers, and then, because those tracers were really expensive and really toxic, and it required a lot of labor, and they had to do a separate set of analyses every time they did this to estimate the, concentra the concentrations of that stuff was lost, and use that loss to estimate the gain of other compounds with different chemical and physical properties. It was costing them hundreds of dollars per sample. And it was really uncertain. And so let's take the uncertainty based on our results down from about 20 to 25 percent down to about 2 percent. And let's figure out a way to transfer our research methods from stuff we did for this one study because I wanted to know and trust a map for Chicago to something that we could use in the exclusive global monitoring network for policy purposes. And so we worked with the GAPS team and uh, Environment Canada to use global weather modeling, global weather reanalyses, global weather observations, and our model, release a publication with open source code come up with all of the big data stuff, bring some trainees in, have them work on different components of this, until we got to a point where we could release a product on the web that instantaneously for free, with quantified and, and super low uncertainty, estimates these things. Reduce the uncertainty in monitoring for global policy purposes from 20 to 30 percent down to 2 to 5 percent. So that's an example of the path, the unexpected path. We didn't go in in, tw in 2010 and say, we'd like to develop a tool that will help global policymakers have more confidence in what they monitor. We're just trying to solve our own problems and address our own questions, and in my case, just wanting to know in the city where I grew up, what are the concentrations and how much do they vary across the city? So that path can be, can take many forms, and what we want to be able to do is to tell, tell those types of stories, and then now that we've seen many of those types of paths, think at the beginning of the study. What might be the eventual outcome? Would it be possible for this to happen? And now that we know that it is possible, how can we design our studies so that over the course of five or ten years, they go from, wouldn't it be nice to know, to now everyone in the world can know for free instantly anywhere? Some of the other 
research translation and translational research that we've been doing at Superfund includes working with NAHS to set up an Ask Me Anything in, on Reddit Science, uh, web application developed by trainees, investigator-initiated research translation of all the observations at the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal, applications for estimating stocks and emissions from every building scale for any city of PCBs and working with our SRP colleagues to extend those to lots of other uh, legacy and emerging contaminants. Bringing polychlorinated biphenyls, their reaction products, and their co-emitted compounds into the regulatory models that are used by United States Environmental Protection Agency for criteria air pollutant regulation. Developing planning tools for Iowa communities for brownfields to help go from, this is a blighted industrial site, it's a brownfield because it might be contaminated, to how can we fine tune our understanding so that we apply testing for the right stuff at the right places most cost effectively. And we've done that with the Iowa Initiative for Sustainable Communities and many local partners. We're using open source toolkits wherever possible, working directly with national federal research centers and regulators uh, and with international communities. We're also looking at that impact. How can we quantify the impact of Superfund Research Program on what policymakers decide and how communities re react to living by a contaminated place? And so this social science with Professor Lucy Lorian in the School of Urban Regional Planning, that where we did new methods development, basic research, applied efforts, studying what happens at places where Iowa Superfund works with communities like Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal, developing methods that we can then transfer out to other Superfund research programs and to then to other stuff that involves contaminated sites beyond Superfund and realizing that this effort from basic to applied to translational research is publishable at all stages and that we can construct at the beginning of a study a path to go from this is what the problem is that we find or the interesting mechanism that we find out to here's what it could mean and iteratively refining how we go about as a center, collectively realizing when we've got a lead that might lead to something, how do we change up what we did when we propose something into might have this outcome to the actual outcomes that we're looking toward, and how to do so most effectively. And so one of the things that we'll be doing over the next five years is figuring out how to teach regulators how to approach polychlorine and biphenyls like criteria air pollutants building an integrated assessment system so that we can bring together all of the ways that our center looks at polychlorinated biphenyls in the environment and people and have them all in one place and develop an interoperable set of hardware, software, data analysis, visualization, data sharing stuff so that whenever we have a discovery in the center about metabolism, about transport and fate, about bioremediation, or how much it costs, that we can have that new patch added into our full understanding of what happens and be able to simulate the effects of that at super high resolution, like intra-urban resolution, intra-school resolution across the continental US at how we bring observations and models together, at how we can develop more of these integrated applications, at how we could eventually get to a point where instead of playing Candy Crush Saga on your phone, you have kids playing, here's my optimal way for reducing my school's exposure to PCBs. Play around with the, with the costs and benefits of cleaning up local 
point sources, of changing what we eat, of cleaning up our schools, getting to a point where our communities can begin to take the same kind of actions that they'd want to take if only they knew. And so take home points, translational research uh, to go box is think about the outcome when you write the proposal, but don't expect that that will be the final outcome. We thought that the outcome for the Chicago state was we would know the sources and fates of polycorn and bipedals in Chicago. We did not expect the outcome would be here's a tool for global policy monitoring to be able to increase their uh, ability to trust their observations. No expectation that that would happen. Work with your end, years, end users to design for outcomes. Figure out what end users might actually want and have that inform your research design, both within a project as well as within a center, as well as with your international research community. Share your data, data in tools in usable formats and expect that this is going to change over time. It's going to take, for each of our trainees, a really long time to see how this plays out in the type of work you do, the methods, the questions, the end users. And so translational research then becomes something that we all do. Research translation is something that, when it's investigator initiated, you might choose to do. Translational research across the center is something that is connected, integrated, refined over time, where we're developing expertise together. I'll take questions. Thanks for attending my talk before the climate strike. And I'm also glad to let you all go on strike now. Uh, and we can, I'll take your questions anytime later too. Thanks.